Okay, so that's it for what we're going to say about first order optimization algorithms. Uh, as I said, we're not going to talk in detail about second order optimization algorithms. Uh, let's look a bit at what happens if we're in a constrained optimization case. That is, what if we want to find the minimum of theta not over its entire domain, but for some subset of the possible values of theta. And specifically, we're going to write these constraints as follows. We're going to write we're going to write our constraint as h of i theta equals 0. So, index by i because we might have multiple constraints and we say that some function of theta must equal to 0. Now, uh, note that this encapsulates many possible types of constraints uh, because we could put any function here. So this just could be just any crazy function that just outputs 0 if this value of theta is allowed and some non-zero value uh, otherwise. So really, we can, we can write any uh, constraint in this form. Uh, sometimes we have constraints uh, uh, that we can, we can optimize more easily if we write them as inequality constraints. So that g, j, again j, just the index of the constraint of theta, has to be less than or equal to 0. So not specifically equal to 0. Um, by the way, notice that in both of these cases, we could pick some other value, but we can, but without loss of generality, we put zero here uh, because we can always, we could, for example, add some constant c to both sides. Uh, and that would give us uh, the constraint that uh, that's only satisfied in the case where h equals some other constant other than zero. And same thing goes for these inequality constraints. Um, Okay, so uh, generally we're going to write our constraints like this, h of i theta equals 0 and g of j theta equals to 0. So a very common uh, one we'll see when we're learning, for example, categorical distributions is the following. Um, we might want it to be the case that sum of theta k, or sorry, sum over k, of theta k equals to 1. In order to write it in this form, we would have to write 1 minus theta k equals to 0. So this would be, so this part would be our h of theta. There are many methods that have been, have been developed for constrained optimization, uh, and we're not going to have a chance to talk about them in this course, uh, we're going to talk about just just one method. Um, uh, in particular, there there are a couple of different issues that come up. Uh, one question is simply how to find a, a value that uh, that's feasible. That is within the constraints. Sometimes just finding a, a feasible value for the parameters uh, can be difficult in its own right. Uh, not to mention actually finding the specific uh, optimum uh, given the parameters, oh, sorry, given the constraints. That said, uh, we're, we are going to talk about one constrained optimization algorithm because it's one that comes up very often in uh, machine learning and uh, probabilistic models. By the way, there is one way that we can reduce a uh, constrained optimization to an unconstrained optimization, and that's as follows. Let's define a new log, a negative log likelihood function L star, where let's say here is our, uh, here is L, and let's say here is our constraints. That's the set of theta we're willing to choose. Well, we can just define L 
prime such that any values of theta outside the constraints are just set to infinity. Now, uh, that works in the sense that we now have a unconstrained optimization problem that exactly matches our constrained optimization problem because we end up choosing one of these points with infinite uh, negative log likelihood or infinite loss. We basically said we failed at optimization. We've ended up with a loss that's positive infinity. It's the worst we could possibly get. Uh, that said, in practice, it doesn't actually help us because, for example, if we want to use a gradient-based method, well, we can't compute the gradient at these, this position that's infinity. Uh, so, sort of mathematically, it's, it's a reduction, but in practice, it doesn't actually help us solve the problem. So, let's look at, uh, as I said, one particular method for constrained optimization that comes up in, uh, that comes up often in uh, uh, machine learning and, and, and probabilistic models, and that is to form what's called the Lagrangian. So for simplicity, let's look at this case. We're trying to minimize a specific L of theta, and for simplicity, let's imagine we have just a single equality constraint, H of theta equals zero. So we can define the Lagrangian, which is a specific way of creating a new function uh, from this constrained uh, problem. The Lagrangian function in this case is defined like this. This is a new function L that takes as input both our parameters and this additional value lambda. And the value of this function equals our initial uh, loss function plus lambda times h of theta. Uh, and and uh, notice we're not, we don't have our constraint directly in this function. So forming this Lagrangian turns out to be very useful mathematically for uh, the uh, constrained optimization because uh, our problem now becomes we want to minimize this Lagrangian function and uh, to do that we take its derivative with respect to both theta and lambda and look for a place where that equals zero. Uh, and that lets us analytically find a solution to constrained optimization problems where often it would be difficult otherwise. So we're going to, so to show why this is helpful Let's do an example. So let's look at the following example. We want to minimize this loss function, theta one squared plus theta two squared minus one, subject to the following constraint. Theta one plus theta two equals one. So uh, we can form the Lagrangian from this. The Lagrangian function now also takes as input lambda, and it's this thing we have our original function plus lambda times. Uh, notice that we have to make our h function. We need something that we require to equal one, so we subtract one from both sides minus one, minus one. So now this thing here, theta one plus theta two minus one is something that needs to equal zero. So now let's calculate our partial derivatives with respect to each one of our parameters. So here's with respect to theta one. Uh, if we do the derivative, you can see it's two times theta one plus lambda. Same thing goes for theta two, two times theta two plus lambda. We'll get to this one in a minute. So now it's worth noting, let's imagine the case where we uh, just wanted to optimize this without taking the Lagrangian. So if we took the derivative with respect to theta one and theta two respectively, without this Lagrangian term, it would tell us that our derivative is always positive. And in fact, it's more positive, the more positive we make our uh, 
our values, which would tell us that we should just always decrease uh, our theta one and theta two, and that we want just we just want them to be zero, uh, and that that would violate our constraint. So, and there's kind of no way to to, to for us to kind of to, other than with the Lagrangian, which we're about to use, for us to tell the, our our gradient descent, for example, that we want this constraint to be met. So, but now notice when we uh, uh, when we add the the Lagrangian term, now we need to pick a value of uh, lambda such that this is zero. Uh, but now uh, it's pretty easy to see, and I'll let you do the algebra yourself. But it's pretty easy to see that now with the system of equations, we uh, can do the math and find that the answer is theta 1 equals theta 2 equals 0 0.5, which you'll notice satisfies the constraint and uh, and also uh, subject to that constraint minimizes this function. So uh, that's an example to show that how uh, the Lagrangian is uh, very useful in practice. It lets us analytically solve a lot of uh, constrained optimization problems that we wouldn't be able to otherwise.